Hi everyone. So in this video, I'm actually going to follow up on a previous video that I've created on the relationship between a firm's unlevered beta and its levered beta. So the symbol that you might see for unlevered beta is either beta U or more commonly beta A, where a beta A basically stands for asset beta. And uh, levered beta, you'll sometimes see the terminology beta L, or sometimes you'll see more commonly actually beta S, where uh, beta S stands for equity. Uh, so S for stock, so equity beta. In a previous video, we established that if a firm is entirely funded with equity, in other words, there is no debt, and for simplicity, let's assume that there are no corporate taxes as well. Well, in that case, a firm's unlevered beta is exactly equal to its levered beta. Or if you want to write it somewhat differently, or as is commonly written, uh, the firm's asset beta is the same as its uh, equity beta. But this is only true if the firm is funded entirely with equity. But what happens if the firm's assets are partly funded with debt and partly funded with equity? How does the relationship between asset beta and equity beta change as a result? Well, that's the question that we are going to address in this video. So what is the relationship between a firm's asset beta and its equity beta when there is debt? So with debt, still assuming that there are no corporate taxes for the sake of simplicity. So basically, imagine that there is a firm which has a bunch of assets and uh, let's suppose this is a restaurant. So from these assets, like all the tables and the chairs and, uh, you know, all the dishes, you know, we are expecting that these assets will produce some cash flows, so financial cash flows. And as I've talked about in a previous video, or as you might imagine, well, uh, this is a business and the cash flows that we can expect from it, well, these are risky. So these are expected uh, financial cash flows. Now let's further assume that these assets have been funded with both debt and equity. So on the right hand side you have some debt and then you also have some equity. And we know that uh, the risk to the equity holders is represented by something called their equity beta. So beta S represents the riskiness of the equity. In other words, the risk that equity holders are bearing by holding the stock of this company. Now for a minute, ignore debt, right? Imagine that these are assets, these are expected to produce some cash flows. The riskiness of these cash flows, as we've seen in a previous video, that is represented by something called an asset beta. And we have established in a previous video that if there were no debt, then all this risk of the underlying cash flows is going to be borne by the equity holders, which is why in that case, when there is no debt, asset beta is the same as equity beta. But now imagine that part of the assets are funded with debt. If you recall, debt is senior to equity. In other words, whenever cash flows are gonna be produced by these assets, first the cash flows are going to go to the debt holders because they have a senior claim which is why generally debt tends to be less risky than equity in fact that begets my second point because equity holders were initially facing all this risk of the underlying cash flows now they're bearing that plus the fact that there is somebody ahead in the line to take cash flows before them right so you first have to wait as an equity holder and see how much is left for you after the debt holders have been paid. Qualitatively speaking, do you think that now you are bearing more or less risk or the same risk as before? I hope you can see that now in the same business, your equity will now be riskier. Why? Because you're not only exposed to the riskiness of the underlying assets, but on top of that, you are bearing the risk that there might not be enough left for you after the debt holders have been paid. And so the punchline here is this, and this is very, very important, that what debt does, what leverage does, is that it makes the risk of the equity holders go up. In other words, equity beta goes up. The risk that an equity holder is bearing is just higher because, again, there is somebody ahead of you in the line to take the cash flows first. But here's the other important point. 
Notice that at the end of the day, when you fund the assets with debt and equity, it doesn't really change the underlying assets. The assets are still the same. They're just funded differently, which means that the underlying asset beta is still the same. So the key point here is that the asset beta does not change with debt. This is the fundamental point here. Leverage or debt only influences the equity beta. It does not influence the asset beta, which is precisely why equity beta is also called levered beta because it gets influenced with leverage and which is, this is precisely why acid beta is also called unlevered beta is because this is the beta that would exist in the absence of leverage in the absence of debt and it also does not get influenced with debt so now the next question you might be asking is like well i see that how higher leverage or higher debt can cause equity beta to go up so I can see that qualitatively they are positively related. If one goes up, the other goes up. But can I say more? Can I say that if leverage goes up by this much, then this is by how much I can expect equity beta to go up? In other words, is there a way to quantify this relationship? And the answer is actually yes, there is. It turns out that when assets are funded partly with debt and partly with equity, we can represent the relationship between asset beta and equity beta as asset beta being the weighted average. So weighted average of debt beta and equity beta. So S over B plus S into equity beta. So don't get alarmed by looking at this equation. All that we're really saying is that again, if on the left hand side we have assets and there's some asset beta here, and we have some debt financing that is happening and debt has some risk denote that by debt beta and more specifically this is not just risk this is systematic risk because that's what beta represents and then equity has some risk and we know that equity's risk is denoted by equity beta all that we're saying is that we can think of asset beta as a weighted average of debt beta and equity beta where the weights are given by the respective market values of debt and equity. So the symbol B here represents the market value of debt. S represents the market value of equity, which is market cap. And B plus S, we can think of as the value of all the assets. So again, at a higher level, you can also think of it as like enterprise value, but don't worry about that. V is basically representing the value of all the assets, which is basically the market value of debt and the market value of equity. So a useful way of thinking about this is to draw an analogy between what you're seeing here and what you may have seen in your previous classes on like uh, stock portfolios. So some of you who are looking at this video may have seen uh, in your previous classes, you know, something like this, where let's suppose you have a stock, say stock X, and then there's another stock, say stock Y, and uh, you are told, that stock X has a beta of say beta X and stock Y has a beta of say beta Y. And let's suppose that you are investing a W uh, portion of your wealth in stock X and therefore one minus W, which is the remainder in Y. And if somebody asks you, okay, then basically you're constructing a portfolio, which is composed of X and Y, what is the beta of your portfolio so p here represents portfolio and uh we basically say well it's just a weighted average so it's w times uh, beta x uh, plus uh, one minus w which is a remainder into beta y this is the portfolio beta we are saying the exact same thing over here we're basically saying you can think of asset beta as the portfolio beta which is a weighted average of debt beta and equity beta you can think of assets as the portfolio that is constructed with debt and equity. So B over B plus S is the weight going in debt and the remainder, which is S over B plus S. And by definition, this is equal to one minus B over B plus S. So this is the remainder that is basically an equity. So this is a useful way of thinking about it. Now, in my experience, what students still tend to have difficulty with is this term debt beta over here. 
because acid beta is somewhat understandable. This is the risk of the underlying assets or how sensitive the firm's cash flows are to market movements. And equity beta is, again, people can sort of think about like, okay, this is how as I as an equity holder, like how my returns change as S&P moves, for example. Uh, what is debt beta? Well, debt beta is something similar. If the market moves up and down because of some unexpected news about inflation or something unexpected about unemployment, you know, if I hold the debt of this particular firm, how do those market movements influence the return that I will get on my debt? That essentially is debt beta. Debt beta is how sensitive are my debt returns to market movements. And now that's a question that you need to think about. Should you expect that if you're holding debt of a certain firm, if you've lent money to a certain firm, would you expect that if the market goes up or the market goes down, that can have an impact on the return that you will make on that debt. Think about that for a second. So here's the thing, right? Imagine if the market does really well and the firm that you've lent the money to, uh, they make a lot of money. If you've lent them money, will you make a lot of money as a result? Uh, unfortunately not, right? Because you lend them money likely at a fixed rate and that is the rate that you're going to get and that is the return that you are going to make and the company is going to make the remainder. Like that's the thing with debt that you basically are asking for a fixed rate of return. So if the market goes up and if therefore the company does well, unfortunately for you, you're not going to make a lot on that upside. Now you might say, well, what about the downside? What if the market tanks and as a result, this company tanks and therefore is not able to generate enough cash flow that it can even pay me back on the money that it promised. And that's absolutely possible. There can be situations where you have lent money to a firm which is either financially distressed or eventually becomes financially distressed. But now think about those companies like Apple, you know, firms which already have a lot of money or cash lying around. Even if the market goes down, think about it. Is that really going to have an impact on the rate of return that you're going to make on the money that you lend them? Chances are no. Why? Because these firms already have a lot of money lying around to pay you back. And so now what are we saying about those firms then? Regardless of whether the market goes up or the market goes down, the risk that you're facing in, or the sensitivity of your bond returns or your debt returns to those market movements, that's minimal. In other words, debt beta is approximately equal to zero. And so that is typically the assumption that we end up making for firms that are not financially distressed, which as in the world of finance, we say are investment grade firms in the sense that their credit or their debt is investment grade rated. So typically we end up assuming that debt beta is approximately in fact equal to zero, but please understand that this assumption is only for firms which are not financially distressed. These are relatively cash rich firms like Apple. And the nice thing about this is then, well, our life becomes a little bit easier from a mathematical standpoint, because if we were initially saying that acid beta is a weighted average of debt beta, which is, well, now we've explained is the systematic risk of debt and equity beta. So S over B plus S into equity. Well, if this is assumed to be zero, then all we are left with is acid beta is equal to S over B plus S into equity beta. And if you rewrite this so that you make equity beta the subject, so then this will be equity beta. Well, you can rewrite this. This will be B plus S over S into acid beta. So basically I've rearranged this equation. This goes to the top, this goes to the bottom, and we can write this in a different way one more time. Actually B plus S over S is the same thing as writing S over S plus B over S into acid beta. So equity beta is S over S plus B over S. And you can see that this is the same thing as this because S is the common factor here. And as you can probably see, well, S over S is basically equal to one. And so that is why you get your famous equation that equity beta is one plus 
B over S into acid beta. And so basically this equation is the same as this equation. There's just two different ways of writing the same equation. One is written as acid beta equal to something into equity beta. And this is basically making equity beta the subject. Notice what this equation is saying. It's basically saying that your equity beta, which is the risk that equity holders bear, is a function of two main things. One, the underlying acid beta. Even if debt is zero, so if even if there was no debt, so that all of this were equal to zero, then you would still have one plus zero or one in the bracket here. And in that case, we would get to our baseline result that equity beta is equal to acid beta. So equity holders at least bear the risk of the underlying business or the underlying assets. And on top of that, if debt is not zero, so that debt to equity is some positive number, well, guess what? Then for a given asset beta, for a given business risk, higher amounts of leverage translate into higher equity beta. And in fact, now you have an equation which says that if debt to equity ratio goes up by a certain amount, then how much equity beta will go up by? And that is exactly what this equation is all about. It is quantifying that relationship that we previously established should exist. As leverage goes up, equity beta should go up. The risk to equity holders should go up. And this equation is telling you exactly how. And so this then is the reason why equity beta is often written as one plus B over S into asset beta. Now with taxes, things change. Up until now, I've been assuming that there are no corporate taxes. With taxes, things change a little bit well, depending on the situation, and that is something that I will talk about in a separate video. If you found this video useful, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to ask any questions using the comment section. Happy learning!